The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, everybody, welcome to Southeast Linux Fest. Um, a couple little housekeeping items. Uh, the uh, first thing is at the registration table, there are surveys. Please fill one out, put it in the box. That will magically become a raffle ticket uh, this evening uh, after the keynote address. There'll be a raffle, lots of prizes and swag. Is there a question about that? Yeah. In years past, you did, but I'm not certain at the moment. But it, it, in years past, yes, it was. It was you have not been to one of the raffles, it's slightly amusing. So. <laughs> Normally there's a lots of stuff, so they go through it fast, so it's a fast ride. So, um, so. And we're good to go. Everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, I had stickers left and swag, and the rest of the shirts went super fast yesterday. So uh, they're uh, they're they're doing the raffle. I think there's a bunch of puppet books in there too. There's probably cooler stuff in there that turns on. Um, thanks 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 for having me out and attending. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be at Self again. And so uh, yesterday was an intro talk. Uh, I know a few of you were able to make it to that. Today's going to be an advanced talk. And tomorrow I'm doing a nine to five tutorial. Uh, so I'm taking the class that we normally ch charge for and takes three days. I'm going to try and condense it into one day. Uh, and so it'll be a quick bootstrap, and you'll walk away with a working, uh, working VMs, have Puppet Master going, have written some code. Uh, it's definitely not going to be like this. Like I'm going to say something, and then we're all going to type for a while. Uh, so it's going to be really like, hands on. So I encourage you guys to do that. Um, uh, first thing about me, uh, I'm an engineer, not a graphic designer or somebody in marketing, uh, and I think that'll be pretty apparent from my slides. Uh, I work for Puppet Labs. Uh, I spend all my time on the road. Uh, when I'm not on the road, uh, a few days a month I get to go home and play with my truck. Uh, I, I, I started using Puppet in uh, 2007. Uh, I was building out a nationwide uh, carrier grade VoIP system. And so I had a lot of kit, different cities, a lot of pre-production environments. Uh, voice is real time. You can't just like restart things or hope people don't notice. Uh, so it had to work. Uh, yep. uh, so I started using config management, got into Puppet. Uh, and then about 30 minutes, it was doing something useful. And away I went. So now I work for them for about a year and a half now. Uh, cool. Puppet Labs is hiring. Uh, professional services. If you too want to live out of hotels and travel, there's that opportunity. Not everybody actually, like no one travels as much as I do there. So uh, you, like, you don't have to live out of them. Uh, we also have software developer positions and tons of other pot spots open. We have remote people, like we have Kelsey in uh, Atlanta. Uh, I'm based out of Indianapolis, so there's that opportunity or to be relocated. Uh, sure. uh, this talk's meant to jump around a bunch. Uh, this is a small group, and I'm hoping people uh, are going to participate like with me. Um, how many folks here uh, are, are already using some config management? Okay, and how many folks are using Puppet? Right on. Uh, how many folks have used M Collective in their environments? None? OK. Uh, Hira? Right on. Cool. So it's going to be different. Um, yeah, let's go through. So have you checked out our style guide for folks that are writing uh, code? Uh, I recommend looking at that. 
Uh, it has the sort of boring stuff you'd expect to see in a style guide, like you use two space tabs and soft tabs, not literal tabs, et cetera. Uh, that stuff's important, uh, kind of, so we've got, we had to maybe put that in there. But it also has more useful things, such as best practices around coding style, um, how, to, how to achieve certain things, what that should look like. Uh, so it's definitely worth looking at for that. Uh, the style guide itself is versioned, and that way you can say you're compliant with version X of the software. It's especially helpful uh, if you're a sysadmin and you're kind of new to developing. Uh, if people all sort of have their own styles, it can make it really hard to write good and coherent code. Uh, so that'll help with that. Um, I would recommend documenting like on your wiki or something. Like we use, you know, version like whatever of the style guide. If you don't like what the style guide has to say, you can say we use version X of the style guide, except for section 4.2.3, because we think public labs is crazy and we do it this way. Right. Uh, but at least then it's it's understood. Uh, right on. Looks like I'm cutting off the top, but uh, all right. So uh, I'm just going to go through a few things on style like that I see that pop up all the time. Uh, is to use four-digit modes. Uh, you're being more explicit as opposed to three-digit modes. If you just use a three-digit mode, we'll, we'll just manage those three digits. Um, so you should just be explicit and, man and do all four. Uh, can anyone read my slides? I'm having a hard time reading them. Yeah? Yeah, that stinks. OK, so uh, this slide's about default fail. And the idea here is that you have different, uh, like this example uses uh, like case entries. And so I have a case based on something, and I have a few entries. And then I have a default. So you always want to have a default for your conditional logic. So whether you're using case or selector, et cetera. And the, the default is to use the fail function. And so in this example that you can't read, I'm doing a case on the operating system. And so I'm saying if you're Red Hat, in include the Red Hat class. If you're a Debian system, include the Debian class. Uh, but then my default is fail. And I say, well, I failed, and I only support Debian and Red Hat. So if another system was to connect, it would just fail. Um, this, is the, this is a great practice as you're doing your logic. Uh, I know when I started off, I was like, well, most of my systems are Red Hat, and some of my systems are Solaris. So I'll just make my default Red Hat, because that's the default for me. And then I'll have these things like case, you know, if it's Solaris, do this. And the default, it'll just do the Red Hat stuff. Um, so that's, that's not really good practice. Like, you want to be more explicit. And so that's why we have the default fail for, for things. Um, next is inheritance. And so here we see. Uh, these different classes. We have class SSH, SSH client inherits SSH, SSH server inherits SSH, SSH server Solaris inherits SSH like server. What's, what's the same with all of these? This one doesn't. They, they are. Uh, what I'm like getting at here is that they're all inheriting within their class structure. So they're all inheriting within that module. So SSH doesn't inherit uh, the server class. Uh, nothing inherits some magical base class that does things. All of the inheritance is done within the given module. Like how many folks now have inheritance that, that goes between modules? Yep. Uh, and what you probably notice from that is it's really hard to track down like uh, how variables and data is like getting set, or there's other resources that just show up and you get problems and it makes it hard. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to do this. So here I have SSH inheriting server, SSH client inherits workstation, WordPress inherits Apache. So we want to stay away from uh, inheriting outside of our modules. Who uses inheritance with uh, their nodes? We're all not going to point and laugh. It's OK. And so uh, this is really common uh, to have something like node app1 inherits base. 
and then you have some base node there that does a bunch of includes, and so you're including those common things like uh, NTP, DNS client, all that kind of basic stuff, right? Uh, so instead of, of using inherits uh, there, uh, instead I would use include. So you can have node da da one I'm gonna include Apache, and I'm gonna include that common class on most people have this. You have got something called generic or common or base or something. Uh, instead of inheriting from it, I'd include it. Um, if, if you don't, uh, I would create a common class and set it up so that every system uses the common class. And there is where I'd put all the things that are common to all of your systems. Uh, so all of your systems probably have time being managed. They probably all have a resolver. They probably all have some sort of kernel tuning. Uh, monitoring, backups, uh, et cetera. And so there's lots of things that all your systems do, um, package management. Um, within my common class, I do things like uh, we showed before with the case operating system. And so based on the OS, if it's Solaris, I'll include my Solaris class, which just does Solaris-related things. If it's Red Hat, it'll get my Red Hat class, which also includes YUM and does things that Red Hat systems care about. right? Um, Another thing I do there in my common class is uh, do like a case statement based on is virtual. And so if it's virtual, I'll include a VM class. And maybe within that, I'll do a case statement on different hypervisors. Uh, and if it's physical system, maybe I call out things that all my physical boxes needed. Maybe they need some IPMI tools installed, things like that. Yeah. Well, one thing in, inherits they include, yeah. Yeah, so I usually use like a case statement on operating system, and so I'll have like, you know, Red Hat, Solaris, Ubuntu, et cetera, and then I'll have that default fail. You know, I only support these in my environment. Uh, and that way you have one place that's really including all those things that are common to all your systems. Uh, and then you would have maybe other things here that are more role specific, like Apache. I just want on dub dub dub, or this could be you know the name of your application that you're putting on your app servers, and you have those modules that are higher up in the stack uh, that start to describe roles of your systems. Um, like, how many folks use the import statement to uh, get 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 code in? No one? Yeah. Uh, so the, the import statement, uh, uh, if you have that in your code, I recommend like grip with your code. If you have it, get rid of it today. It's like the first thing uh, I, I rip out uh, client engagements because it causes a ton of problem, uh, like problems. So uh, instead we look at using the auto loader. So that's using modules and the module system layout. It's just a, uh, a directory structure, and if you adhere to it for your code, then uh, Puppet knows how to find classes on disks. So you can say, like, include SSH, and it knows where to find that. Uh, so use that. Don't use import. Yeah. Uh, right on. Uh, what sort of version control systems do people, uh, are people using with Puppet? I heard git. Anything else? What's that? Subversion? We got any uh, bizarre people here? Mercurial? CBS. Perforce? Uh, yeah, that's good. Glad you're not using Perforce. Uh, so uh, I recommend uh, adding pre-commit hooks to your system. Like, who's using pre-commit hooks with their puppet code now? What's that? Yeah. So one, one piece of software to check out uh, is Puppet Lint by Tim Sharp. Uh, and you can run Puppet Lint over your code, and it will tell you if uh, uh, there are issues with style. Uh,
Maybe I have network access. We'll see. Nope. All right. Anyways, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a good like demo if something didn't work. Uh, but check out uh, the Puppet Lint software. So it's, it's going to lint your code for uh, style. And so if you go against the style guide and do things, it'll give you either warnings or errors. And then you can suppress those as necessary. So if you're OK with certain things coming up, uh, and that's cool with your style. You can suppress all that. I recommend sticking this on as a pre-commit hook. And that way, uh, if, if, if code's not passing the lint, you can just reject it before it even gets committed. Uh, yeah. um, an, an, another one to use is Puppet Parser Validate. Uh, so if you're using old versions of Puppet, uh, it was like Puppet dash dash parse only something. Newer versions, Puppet Parser Validate, and then your manifest file. And this will check for syntax. It's really easy to write bad puppet code or code that does dumb things, but let's, let's at least not accept it into the repo if it doesn't pass a syntax checker, right? Uh, you can also syntax check uh, Ruby with this gibberish, and that'll, or sorry, the uh, templates with like that gibberish, and it'll do the uh, check your ERB files. I recommend also having this in your pre-commit hooks. Um, I would start with these three things, and then as you mature and what you're managing with Puppet, start adding more. Uh, so like if you have uh, sudo in there, you can use vice sudo dash c dash f to check your sudoers file. You can do things like if you're running bind, uh, bind comes with like a, uh, name d like a check zone and check conf. And so there's, there's, there's different ways that you can you know, check, check your code. And so I recommend putting those in, in your pre-commit hooks. Yeah. Um, I've got a I've got a pre-commit hook in my uh, G Honeycut dash SVN module uh, has a <coughs> pre-commit hook code in there. Uh, yeah, uh, that a gentleman uh, Robert Long wrote in Perl uh, years ago. That's a one, and that's a pipe. Yeah. Cool. So some best, so, so, some best practices, uh, starting from a known base when creating systems. Uh, how many folks here are dealing with uh, the, or use Pixie? Yeah? Uh, and how many folks are using uh, some other like cloudy tools to spin up instances? Yeah. Right on. So starting from that known base, knowing what's going on there, um, you want to provision systems uh, should be small, and they should be common. So you shouldn't have different images if you're going uh, some of that, like that, that route with like cloudy solutions or VMware, uh, that well, where you have a different image for your web server versus your database versus your app server, things like that. Um, same with if you're using Kickstart, Jumpstart, things like that, you want uh, to have that one kickstart file that sets up uh, the smallest thing of what it means to be a node on your network. So you don't want a kickstart for the web server and another kickstart for the database server. In actuality, you might have different kickstarts for different types of hardware that you support, but the functionality that comes out is gonna be that same small uh, base node. Um, and then we're gonna build on top of that with Puppet. So here we have blank hardware, a lack of a VM, it gets provisioned through our provisioning process, and then we have this base install. Um, and then Puppet is going to configure and manage that system after that. That way, you know uh, where the configuration takes place. It's not, well, part of it's in the provisioning process, and part of it's in Puppet. It's one place to go. Um, like, how many folks have this part built? where they have this base install, and then maybe they run some scripts, or there's like a big post section, and it creates a box. Yeah, so Puppet's gonna get past there, because it's gonna do that, but it's also gonna maintain the system, so to ensure that state. Cool. Uh, so like moving on to software repositories, how many folks uh, run their own software repos? Right on. How many people connect out to the internet? 
Yeah. So uh, who uses ensure latest in their code? Yeah. Uh, and what's, what's, what's that by you? It, 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 it gives you the ability for packages. You drop a new package in your repo. Next puppet run, it gets updated, right? Uh, the issue with that is, uh, especially if you're running uh, repositories that are uh, connected to the internet, uh, somebody updates a package in some repo, and uh, suddenly your systems are getting updated. So one of the probably most uh, change-inducing things you can do to your system is start patching software, and so you want to have some like testing ar around that. Um, also, with ensure latest uh, in your code, you might have systems um, update out of out of step with each other. So imagine you you're running some application and it needs a specific version of some library, and then half your systems update, and the other half haven't. You know your your your, your app might start doing weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be the next slide. Um, who, who puts uh, specific version strings in their code? Uh, and so the, like, those are even worse because now you're duplicating data. And so now when you add a, a package to your, pack to your like, software repo, you also have to go in there and like, copy and paste some string into your code. And so now you're duplicating all of this. Uh, and it's just a ton of overhead. So you want to run your own software repositories, uh, connecting to the it, it, internet's like not good. Uh, you could have packages that are mysteriously missing. Maybe there's some security issue and somebody pulls a package from the repo, but you really need that package to build your systems, and maybe you're not really affected by the security thing, but now it's gone. Um, you get much faster provisioning, obviously, if you're connecting to local systems as opposed to boxes on the net. Um, <coughs> And you really want the ability to version control your software repositories. Um, when I say version control my software repos, that's not to uh, say that I use SVN or Git, et cetera, uh, with my repos. Uh, those, those systems really aren't meant to hold a bunch of binary data. Um, but what I do is something simple where I'll have a directory uh, that I'm keeping my data in, and then I'll create symlinks. And so like, what I can do is I can mirror you know, CentOS to here, and then maybe I have some updates. Uh, it should probably be updates instead of base. But then when I want to do an update, I'll uh, do an update into a different directory. And now I can just point the symlink from, from uh, this directory to my new one. And I can do that per environment. So I could say, well, in dev, I want to change the symlink to, this, uh, n to these new RPMs, I just like downloaded, see how that works, run my you know, apt get update, uh, get update, et cetera. And if that's good, like, then I can do my next environment, et cetera. Yeah? Yep, that's what I'm saying. So you might have prod pointing here, devs pointing to some other directory, staging pointing to some other directory, and then you can put it through your change management process so you can say, well, instead of just up, like running updates uh, in prod, you know, I can uh, test them out in, in like this environment. I could test them there. Um, and then you, by doing this, you also get the side effect of knowing when things changed and what changed. Uh, and if you keep a change log, uh, I usually just keep a real simple just a change log text file here. Then you'll know why things change. So was this just your whatever weekly, quarterly, et cetera, patch update? Uh, was this a specific thing that solved a problem? And you can have that information. Um, and this makes it re like really easy to know at any point in time what uh, software you were using and what your patch levels were. Uh, yeah. So to use this, I also use uh, hard links, uh, which will set up hard links between the directories. So uh, you, you won't have a ton of like disk usage if you're not using a deduplicating file system. Um, 
Like any questions on software repos before we move on? Great. So uh, this is just a bind style serial. So this is saying uh, 2012, June 9th, and that would be my first one of the day. Yeah. Uh, cool. So next is Hira. Uh, here is the the new hotness in Puppet. Um, it's not it's not that new though. We I've been using it with clients all year. It ships as a part of Puppet Enterprise now. You can download it by doing like gem install uh, Hira and like set it up. And what Hira does is it allows for you to uh, decouple data from your modules. So I can do a call to Hira and say get this data as opposed to putting it right in my module. Like how many folks in their modules, they have uh, business logic type things stuck in there. So I'm saying like if you're in this environment and it's, uh, you're in this data center, then you need to pull this kind of data. Like does anyone do that stuff now? Uh, but you would see where you might want to change data based on different parameters. So maybe if you're in one data center versus another like data center, maybe things like your uh, name servers and LDAP servers, et, et cetera, change. Uh, maybe between environments, uh, things uh, change, like uh, you want to change your MySQL passwords so that the devs could possibly see it, but when it goes to production, uh, it pulls a different password that they don't know. Um, like how many folks have like passwords and stuff in their puppet code, which is keeping them from being able to publish it? No? Okay. Uh, is everyone still super confused on what here is? I wouldn't. <laughs> it, de it depends on you, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, so like really uh, uh, allowing me to decouple data from modules. So when we started uh, down this road of really like wanting to write modules that were really portable, what we found out was we could write a great module, but then you would need to edit it and put in values for things that meant something to you. Like I could give you a module that would manage your Etsy resolve conf, but then you would need to go in and uh, like change that to you know, put in your name server, your search path, et cetera. Right? Uh, and then we moved to using parameterized classes. And so now I could instantiate this class with some parameters. So I could call DNS client uh, class and then give it a parameter of name servers and some array. So that, 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 that moved me closer to decoupling data from my code, but it still wasn't there. You would still have to like, like modify things. Um, and so now we have Hira, and we can just ask Hira. So let me uh, show some actual code here. Um, can people read these lines here? Does it help if I highlight them? So like what I have going on here is I have dollar sign test equals Hira. And then it's looking up for a key called test. And then I'm just using a notify to give me that output. And so uh, some other place you might like use this is, um, really? Uh, and of course you can't read anything here. So like what I'm doing here is I've got user root, and I'm saying password, and I'm looking it up from Hira. This says root password. It's looking up this key. Uh, and then I have a default uh, hash, MD5 hash. So I could set this to set root passwords for my systems. Um, like how many folks now regularly change their root password even? Yeah? Uh, and how long does that take? Yeah? Yep. Uh, so let's show a bit more of what Hira looks like here. So I've got this Hira data directory. And underneath it, uh, I have a Hira.yaml. Folks, read this. Like, does it need to be larger? 
I can't make it brighter, unfortunately. Uh, so what's going on here is I'm telling it that the back end is YAML. That's our default back end. Uh, Hira is pluggable. So you could also have JSON, MySQL, whatever else you wanted to write. Uh, the, the back ends for these, I think, are like 50 lines of code or so in Ruby. So uh, it would be not so hard to write your own if you wanted to. I think someone also wrote one for G, like GPG, and they'll do GPG encryption uh, for the, their like YAML files. Um, so here's the interesting place. I'm defining my hierarchy. Uh, here it is hierarchical. And so what it's doing is it's gonna look in these different places for that key that I looked up. So the key I was looking up was test, and it's gonna look in these different spots. And just like uh, a path statement in Unix it's going to stop on that first match. Uh, so here, each of these bits in the percent are variables. And so these are all facts. And so I have a custom fact called DC for data center, a custom fact uh, ENV for what environment I'm in. Uh, my, my example here is dev QA and prod. Um, so here I could actually do one-offs per individual nodes. So I've got FQDN slash FQDN uh, per, percent. FQDN, and so that would actually look up in that system's uh, fully qualified domain name .yaml and look for a value, so I could put values based on that one system. Here I could say if you're in a given uh, like data center and a, a given environment, I could load up data from there. So maybe uh, when you're in this data center and you're in this environment, you have different data. I could just do, that. like then I just look at just the environment. So maybe, like maybe I have things that just change per environment, like uh, MySQL passwords is a great one. Um, and then maybe I just have things that are just common to the data center themselves. So if you're ever in the SCA like data center, you use these sets of servers. If you're in CLT, you use these sets of servers. And then I have just a common file that I look for, and so that's, that's the last one. So this is gonna be most, most specific to least specific. Um, so in each of these, um, they're just like YAML. And so here I have the key, and then I have the value after the key. Um, so I also have FQDN, test.tld, underneath my data centers, I then have environments. Um, right, and then I have a common class as well. Uh, I recommend sticking a key like test at the top of all of your YAML files that you use, because then you can use it to quickly look things up. So I'll show how to do that on the command line, uh, and then I think that'll demonstrate it in the code. So here I can say Hira look up test. Um, let me look, show this to you first. So if I do Hira look up test, it's going to read it from common because it doesn't know about my data center, or my environment, or my fully qualified domain name. Now if I tell it test. Um, and equals uh, prod, then we see it, it returns prod because it's, it's reading from this prod dot like YAML and we see test is, is, is prod, right? So now I can do like data center is Seattle and we see it's reading from that YAML file, right? I could do, what would happen if I put my FQDN here? What's that? Right, and we see it comes from the FQDN. Yeah. Or if I put maybe just my data center, it's reading just from that file. And since we're hierarchical, um, we're just using the file system to store, to store these uh, for, like this one for the like, YAML backend, you could use file system permissions to change who has access to what. Uh, so you could put this on like an NFS share or something, export it out, change the permissions so that maybe only developers can edit the dev.yamls. Um, that way they could do things like set you know, application passwords, et cetera, 
uh, and it would be that what like like they could see. Uh, but then for other environments, you could set things like passwords, et cetera. Yeah. To cover a what? Sure, so you have some data, you could store that in these like YAML files and then look them up. Uh, I, th I think YAML will support binary. Uh, another way to do it might just be to ha have here be telling it which blob to pick off the disk and use it with a source uh, attribute for like a file resource. Um, all right, so uh, other things that you can do with this, uh, empower folks to make changes in the environment. So uh, let's say you're running a website and you want to allow developers to tune, to tune things or like change stuff. So you could have templates that use these variables that are getting pulled from like Hira and let, and let some teams you know, work on, on like tuning those. And so they might not have to know how the code actually works, but they could go and tune that data. So you've really decoupled data from the code and now you have this data-driven uh, model of your environment. And now people can just start changing data and they don't necessarily have to know what the code is. Uh, which is great, and I'll show an example of that. Um, uh, so here I have a DNS client. So it just manages uh, resolve.conf. And so I have a class, and it's going to include DNS client colon colon data. And notice here, I don't have any data. I don't even have the path. So maybe it's yours isn't Etsy resolve conf. Uh, you could put it somewhere else. Uh, owner group and mode, probably root root 0644, but that, that in and of itself is data. Uh, maybe somebody else wants theirs to be like different. So in this way, I've written a module that's truly uh, portable. And I can hand you like this module and you could never touch the code, but still have access to override any of these values. And so let's look at the data class. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah. So here uh, I have name servers equal, and I'm doing a hero lookup. Uh, let, me, let me turn off the syntax to see if that helps. So here I've got dollar sign name servers equal Hira, and I'm doing a lookup on this key. And so if I've specified what my name servers are, it'll use that. And then I put in same defaults. And so if you don't specify anything, I'm just going to use a few name servers from Google uh, that they made publicly accessible. Uh, same thing with uh, my owner group and mode for the Etsy resolve conf. Uh, I put in a key. So if you wanted to override it, you could. And then the second uh, parameter is just a uh, uh, default. So, you know, root root 0644. Uh, so something else that I'm doing here is setting uh, certain options to unset by default. And so there's multiple ways to check if a variable is set, uh, which can get kind of confusing and look really crazy in your, uh, in your template files. So what I do is I just set it to a string uppercase unset as a design pattern. And let's take a look at our template file. So here I have a lot of syntax checking. So here I have a template, and so I'm saying if search path is not unset, then I'm going to put search and the search path like variable. Same thing with options. Uh, if it's not unset, put in options. If you haven't supplied anything, you know those lines just won't show up in your resolve conf. Uh, 
Here I have code that's just iterating over an array. And so it's just doing a for loop of the array and printing out name server and the elements there. So we can see this in action. Um, so I already have this uh, uh, associated with my code. And I'll show that in the, uh, maybe I'll show that here in the dashboard. Oh, crap. So here I have a default group. And I've associated the NTP and DNS client uh, are like, like classes. So just to show those are associated with all my nodes. Um, so I get the defaults from, uh, from the module, right? So you can just download this module, like use it. You never made any changes, and it's useful to, to, to you because it works. I could also say, well, if I'm in uh, the Seattle data center, I want to do something different. So I think we call them DNS client name servers. And then here's how you would specify an array in YAML, just uh, with the dashes. So I'll use some other like name servers out there. And so that'll just change systems that are in Seattle. So let's look and see what my systems are. So I've got factor-p uh, data center uh, here in Charlotte. Charlotte and my CentOS 6 box I think is in Seattle. Right. So what we would expect is that only this box would change the resolve conf. So we'll just go ahead and kick off some runs. We've all seen this a million times. I'm running all these on my laptop here, so it's a little slow. So that's DHCP messing with me here, like fighting it out with Puppet. So here we see this box in, is in Charlotte, so it gets the defaults. Uh, this box is in Charlotte, it gets the defaults. This one already had Puppet running. But we would expect, since this one is in Seattle, that it's going to get uh, the new name servers that we specified, the 4.2.2.1 and 2. If you can't have defaults, can you still use that? Yeah, so you don't have to specify defaults. So you might make it to where somebody really has to fill in that data to use your module. Uh, and that's OK. But you've, you, you've, you've at least built a module now that isn't specific to you and really is portable. To me, that's, that's, that's the litmus of, is my module uh, a good module? Uh, is, could somebody else drop it in place and use it as is? Um, and here we see it's 4.2.2.2. So imagine like using this for you know, passwords, uh, like root password, et cetera. You, you could use this to, for uh, you know, your configs. I mean, really, I try and use this for every piece of the data itself, like all my attributes I want to be uh, overridable, and so I use Hira. Um, uh, I've got another one, another module I'll show, which is NTP. And so here, I'm saying you can set things like package latest. And so I've got logic there. So by default, it'll just say uh, ensure present. But if I wanted to turn on this like latest, I can make it do ensure like latest. Um, so here I've got just saying defaults. Here I've got some template like data. So by default with my NTP module, you'll get 
you know, 01 and 2.us.pull.ntp.org. You can optionally set server options, orphan mode stratum, fudge stratum. Um, and there's a ton of other NTP options that just aren't in here yet. Uh, this one's a little more in depth in that I have some code here that's doing uh, conditional logic to set uh, some sane defaults. And so here we, we know if you're in a Debian system, it's called the service is NTP, whereas a Red Hat, it's NTPD. And so I can set these sort of sane defaults. Again, there's my default fail. So now I have the same default. I'm saying the package name is Hira, and I'm looking it up, or I'm using that same default that I took based on my operating system, right? So I'm able to abstract those things out. Um, So, so here it would be on your puppet master, okay. uh, and then you would need to take uh, appropriate measures to, you know, lock down file system levels, security, who has access, et cetera. Okay. Yep. Uh, here it be, that would be either not in Git or in several repositories. Yes, you could, you could, you could revision it if you wanted to, uh, and so that could be in its own repo. Uh, depending on how you want to like set it up, um, yeah, yeah, you might even look at using something like SVN that's not distributed, so that you can do uh, access control, things like that. Uh, so here I'm doing that same pattern that we saw in the resolver. So I'm, I'm doing a for loop. So server, servers dot each do like server, and so this is going to put my time servers, and then for each line I also have conditional logic. So if server options is not on set, then I put in the server options. So by default, it'll just say like uh, server, you know, o.pool.ntp.org. But if I had set server options, it would stick those in, et cetera. <coughs> Does anyone see where, where they could use here? Where here might be like valuable? What are some, some spots where people are thinking, hey, I could use here to solve a problem? No one? Is it time for coffee and beer? Like, what's... <laughs> yeah. So if everything's one off and different... I've only had two of those. I have it. It's a little hard to believe, but it's, it's definitely not, like, not a good thing. But that gets back to... To like the here like dot yaml, so you could put those in by the fqdn, and this you can change too. And the great thing about this is, maybe you just care about the environment in common, and then you move, and now you have multiple like data centers, so you need to put like those in. So that just means you change the file system like hierarchy. So you made a couple directories, you copied some data around, so it makes it really easy to change what this hierarchy looks like. Um, people also like use this for. Um, like if you're managing multiple sites, you might have some custom fact for that. Or maybe you're using Puppet to manage multiple customers. And so you might have this based on like customer, like something like that. So it makes it really easy to modify and change up. Um. Cool. Uh, does anyone know how long we have in here? Okay, uh, so in 10 minutes, uh, I've got M Collective that, that I can show, or we can probably spend some more time talking about change management and version control. Do you guys want to talk about version control? Do you guys want to talk about M Collective? M Collective. Okay, so M, M Collective itself, uh, it, it works with a message bus. We use ActiveMQ, and it gives us the ability to trigger uh, actions on a subset of our systems or all the systems. Um, this is really great so that you can automate what's going on so that you're not going to make those errors at 3 a.m. Uh, for instance, Ari, the fellow that wrote M Collective, he was managing a lot of mail servers, so he has tasks that would 
like flush mail queues, et cetera. And so he could do that on all the systems or maybe just the systems in Africa or maybe all the systems that are in the prod environment. Uh, and I'll show how that works. So we can do things like MCO ping. And so it's going to tell us all the systems uh, out there. So now I could say, well, I can start to do filters. And I could say, well, I just want to return systems that are in Charlotte. And so we can start, start to take actions on those systems. Um, I'm going to show that through our console. Awesome. Here we go. So it's, it's finding these nodes in real time here, which is real time is not awesome on my laptop. And so here's like things I can do is uh, I can manage resources from here. So I can look and see uh, differences on my systems. So let's check out the root user across all of here. So here I see there's some differences on some of my systems. Uh, but it it's, uh, allows me to go in there and check those out. Um, the things that you can do with M Collective is to control Puppet. So I could disable the Puppet agent on all my systems, which is great if you're about to do a maintenance event. I mean, if you're about to stop MySQL so you can do something to the data set, you really don't want Puppet just starting it back up, right? Uh, so here I could do, like, like, disable, go do my maintenance event, come back, enable it, like, turn it back on. Um, I can get last run like summary so I can see like what happened. Uh, I can't actually see this window. Hold on a moment. Can you run specific shell commands? Uh, no. And the reason for that is uh, mcollect is not meant to just run shell commands. It's meant to take actions and get back specific data. Uh, and so you're dealing with data and not freeform text. Uh, also with M Collective, it, it returns you back uh, text to the output when something fails, not when it works. I mean, imagine trying to run yum update across 10 different machines and getting all that output piped back to your terminal. Like, how useful would that be to look at, right? So instead, it's going to run yum update, expect certain returns or certain like data back. And then if it, if it failed, it would give you those like messages. Um, other things we could do is like run, run once. We could get the status of all the systems. Yeah. Uh, here I can filter. So I could filter based on a node name. I could filter based on class. So maybe I only want to mess with systems that are in development. So let's filter. And so now this should just show me just those systems. So I've got just the P Ubuntu. Or maybe I want to just operate on systems that are in Charlotte. And so this really gives you this ability to manage your, uh, to, so to orchestrate what you're doing on these different systems. Uh, so I can do something like just in dev. I want to, or just in Charlotte, we have package tasks. And so I talked about not having ensure latest in your code. Instead, I would want an out of band process to say, I want to update my systems at this point in time. And so you could use M Collective as that out of band process. So I could say, I want to run, you know, apt update or yum check updates, et cetera. Uh, another thing you might do is like yum clean when you've been changing your like repos around. So I could trigger that on. All my systems, subsets, etc. Yeah. How do you define, or how are these commands defined? How do you define new commands to run to? Like yeah, so you would write new agents uh, that are written in Ruby, and you could define new agents that would uh, like run these different commands. Once you define the agent, they automatically populate into this interface? Nope. 
No, this is uh, this is the interface for the enterprise console. So you can't expand these service tasks, package tasks, or you could. You would just have to modify what's going on here, uh, or like modify the dashboard. Um, but they just don't pop up. Uh, you can also do service administration here. So I might get the status of uh, a service on my systems. Or use this to run our stop and start like services. So maybe I'm about to do a maintenance event. I want to disable Puppet. I want to go to systems that are in, you know, in this environment and I want to stop these services, then maybe I do like whatever maintenance, then I can start things back up. So it allows me to sort of manage that orchestration that you need to do when working on systems. You can take agents out from system also, right? Yep, so I can, I can remove them from here. I can just click on them and say, I, you know, I just want that one, et cetera. What I was thinking about first is you, know, you pull the root password back. Under my current security environment, they're probably not going to appreciate that. So I can remove that agent and prevent that from happening. I, I don't understand what you're saying. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so that we don't do that out of the box now, but uh, you could also just interact directly with M Collective on the command line, uh, and then perhaps write filters around that. So you could use like sudo, for example, and only give people access to run certain like commands via sudo. Um, so the last few minutes here, um, I've only got a couple. Do uh, folks want to go through the change management stuff quickly? Or uh, do, do you guys want to do Q&A? Okay. Uh, so here's the structure I use for uh, version control system. This is given an SVN view. Uh, this could just as well be Git. Um, here I have trunk or master. And this is where my best working code is. Uh, I don't actually ever make changes here. I only make changes via merging. But this is supposed to be best known working code. Um, I have tags. Here I'm using tags. I'm doing the bind style serials again, so I know what's going on. The, the tags here are just tags of trunk. And so I'm saying at this point in time, trunk was good. Uh, tags are meant to be immutable. They're not in subversion, They're not really in Git. But th that's what they're like meant to be. You're not meant to change tags. Uh, then the other directory is branches. and so. Underneath like branches, I have uh, numbers, and these numbers correspond to the ticket number for the request. Um, you might also have like an underscore and then some like short blurb so you could remember what those are. But the idea here is that you have topical branches uh, and not long-lived branches. Uh, so when I first started off with this, I had a branch for each of the people that were working on the code. So there's like a Garrett branch, an Eric branch, et cetera. And that quickly got us into merge hell. Uh, you don't want to run these long-lived sort of nebulous branches. You want very short topical ones. And so here, a change request might like come in. We need to change my Apache config to do X, which might be a change request that somebody like you would put in because you know what you're talking about. Uh, somebody else might put in some change requests where they're just like, the web servers are slow. and so. You know, you would work with that. You would know that you need to modify and tune your Apache configs or something. So you, you would do the work here, uh, test it, and then you would want to merge it into trunk. Um, when you do this merge, so you got the topic branch and you merge back into trunk, uh, there's two methodologies for this. And you might use one or the other or both. Uh, and one is to enforce a bottleneck for quality. So you say one person or this type of person needs to be the person that merges it in. This is great if you're on a team where like one or a few people have a lot of puppet experience, and then you have other folks that don't have the experience. You don't want them just merging into trunk. So you say somebody that knows what they're doing needs to do it. And uh, the other way is to use plus one. And so the idea there is if you have people that have similar puppet knowledge uh, having one person or a small group be a bottleneck is just, that's just a bottleneck. At that point, you're not getting extra quality. So the idea there is that if you wrote the code, somebody else has to merge it in. Uh, then you get two sets of eyes on the code. Uh, and you also get the perspective of 
Uh, it's not uh, one person that broke the code, and so it changes the team dynamic a bit, So because multiple people have signed off on it. Um, once you get code into trunk, I would have a separate uh, testing environment where you have w one representative system of every role type that you have. Uh, that way you can test on those. I would provision those from scratch, run the test, like do that. Uh, you want this to be different than maybe like a dev environment that developers actually use. I'm totally like going over for a while. And uh, uh, the reason for that is you, you don't want to break stuff that the developers are actively like working against or they're, they're not going to like you. Um, so here I got the puppet test environment, everything's good, and I take a tag of trunk, because I know, or master, because I know at that point in time my code was good, so I take a tag of it. And then I'm going to associate that tag with my different environments. Yeah. Like any questions on this, or questions in general, as I'm running way over? Uh, to appease your security folks, you might want to have them in the loop of what's being changed. And so, uh, since you can do things like just look at diffs, as opposed to, you know, just trusting admins to do the right thing, it does make it easier that way, in that you can actually just show them diffs and say, look, here's how the code's like changing. We did this in dev. What do you think about it? And they can sign off and look at the code. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, I'm getting the hook to get off stage here. Uh, again, I'm doing the tutorial tomorrow if you want to come to that. Uh, and if you have more questions for me, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find me in, in the bar after the uh, next talk. So. Yep, uh, the slides will be available at garretthoneycutt.com. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. 
uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Well stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.